This is off planet radio. Everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. Uh, the website is offplanetradio.com. We're in a new season here of, uh, well, some heavy hitting shows. And this one tonight, I think, will be one of those shows that hits the mark, the target, the high water mark of what we do. And uh, my illustrious co host will begin to unravel the guest and the mysteries we're going to explore. Hi, everybody. Hi, Randy. Nice to be back. And guys, I am so excited for this one. I can't even tell you. I think when I joined Randy a couple of years ago, this guy was on my, my was on the first list I made. And I don't know how we got away from it, but somehow I did. And, and it came up again recently. And I'm so glad he's going to be joining us here tonight. So um, our guest tonight, his research, uh, he's a seeker, an author. His research transcends both time and space. He investigates ancient hidden history and modern esoteric mysteries and attempts to unveil the truths that have been hidden in plain sight. His investigations range from searching out the secrets of ancient civilizations and their hidden archaeology to probing the present for answers in regards to UFOs, portals, symbolism, spirituality, and humanity's greater potentials. His research also explores the emerging cosmic symbolism that's been incorporated into public art, architecture, and pop culture. He believes the combinational experience we get from visiting both the ancient sacred landscapes and the modern urban portals can be something akin to a time machine experience. We're able to look to the past while feeling in the present and sometimes even glimpsing the future. This is the true gateway experience. His work has largely focused on the anomalies, stargates, and symbolism of his home state of Michigan. This one has been a long time coming, guys. Chad Stumke, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Uh, thank you so much, Emily and Randy. I appreciate the invite, and I'm really excited for our show tonight. Good to have you on. Good to have you on. This ticks all the boxes tonight. This is <laughs> Off Planet Radio. <laughs> planet Radio, maybe. I don't know. Yes, maybe come Interplanet Radio <laughs> exactly. at some point tonight. So, all right. So, when I reached out to you, Chad, you sent me a link to your most recent sort of article and thing you've been invest investigating. So, let's kind of jump in there. First of all, before we do that, Please tell people about yourself. This is your first time on the show. You're super interesting. Tell people how you got into doing what you do. Uh, well, I grew up in Flint and Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I now live up by Traverse City in the northern part of Michigan uh, with my family. Uh, I got into this. I had a couple of UFO experiences years back, and uh, those experiences kind of pushed me into explorer mode, so to speak. I obviously just had the urge to find out, you know, what had happened. And over the years, that explorer mode has made my investigations range from everything from ancient mound sites to the star ancestors to ancient mythology. And that kind of led me down the rabbit hole of uh, portal and stargate symbolism in some of our urban centers. So that's kind of where I got my start from. Cool. Yeah. I am, um, you know, I think the, the, I don't know what I was doing. I think I was looking at more like techno stuff or looking at like, I mean, I was already into alternative information, but I think I was looking for some, I had developed this idea. This was probably about seven or eight years back that parties were portals, right? And so I went looking for information on parties being portals. And I think somehow uh, like a video or a speech that you had did, done on, on Heart Plaza or something like that came up. I found like a video and I watched that and I was like, hot damn, man, that's exactly right. <laughs> And so, yeah, that was my, my introduction to you. And, um, you know, I've looked into some other stuff you've done over time and whatnot, but uh, I'm, I, I find your work really, really interesting and it feels um, kindred to me. You know, and I, I really love it. So um, let's start where we're going to start tonight, though, and that is your well, first off, let's mention, I, I think Chad has a new website up and uh, he might want to tell people about that because it, uh, I just went over and looked at the website and this is a nice website, man. Yeah. Well, thank you, Randy. Yeah, it's chadstumpke.com. And uh, actually I just had it redone recently. So it's all brand new and updated and I'm pretty proud of it. Pretty cool. Yeah, it looks pretty Looking cool. Like, yeah. 
Yeah, looks, this is yeah, really much, nice. It looks much different than whatever I looked at years ago when I first looked. So yeah, it looks really nice. And Absolutely. yeah, I like all the symbolism and stuff like that. So, all Thank right. You. So, you. okay. So when I reached out to you, you told me that you had some new work that you kind of wanted to debut here on the show. And we love that. We love getting stuff first. And um, so why don't you go ahead and tell us what you've been looking at recently? It looks like you've done probably a couple of years worth of research on this before you really put it all together. So let's hear about it, man. Yeah, a couple of years is an understatement. I've probably spent a good seven or eight years. I, this is one thing I did not want to put out prematurely, which mm -hmm. I see happen quite often. And what I discovered is a underwater, I call it an underwater anomaly. Uh, first we'll go over its location. It's off the upper peninsula of Michigan. Uh, there's a peninsula called the Keweenaw Peninsula and an island called Isle Royal. And I've been investigating, we have what's called the Michigan Copper Mystery here, where we have over a half billion pounds of copper missing from these ancient copper mines on Isle Royal that date back to four and 5,000 years ago. So I was researching these ancient copper mines on Isle Royal and I was using Google Earth and looking for some ancient harbors possibly. And I instantaneously almost, when you zoom in on Isle Royal, you'll realize underwater just off the north coast of Isle Royal is a feature that just does not fit in. And it's submerged in about 500 feet of water. It's a oblong circlish feature and it's very, very uniform. The walls appear to be about 250 feet tall, and it appears to have an opening. Yeah, we're looking at it right now. Perfect. Much easier to describe. There we go. Now, this feature is approximately at its longest point, three and a half miles across, and at its shortest point, two and a half miles across. And the opening you can see on the northern side of it is approximately a quarter mile across. So I've been looking at this thing for years. And Which lake is this in? This is in Lake Superior. I'm Lake sorry. Superior. Lake okay. Superior, and it's right on the U.S. and Canadian border, just mm -hmm. inside the U.S. border. So I've been studying this thing for years, and it just does not fit in. If you Google Earth, the underwater features around it or in any of the Great Lakes, there's nothing even similar to this. So I've been doing research on this and, you know, at first I started with emailing colleges and their underwater departments and pretty much very little responses from them. So I started actually going up to the area and talking with people, with locals. I talked to ship captains, you know, I've talked to scuba divers, I've talked to people that go out there and look for shipwrecks and nobody has been familiar with this object. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've spent a good seven, at least seven years, really trying to find somebody. I mean, I've scoured the libraries, I've scoured museums, and I've just came to a point where I can't find any information on it. I don't believe there is any out there at this point. So over the years, I've been asking people's opinions, you know, professionals and just friends, just asking their opinions, you know, what do you think this could possibly be, this uniform structure here in Lake Superior? So over the years, I've came up with several possible, you know, the most likely possibilities and the most suggested possibilities. So in this article and this video, I go through those possibilities and my hopes are realis realistically is that somebody out there may know what this is and I just haven't found them because I've been thinking about this thing for forever, it seems like, and I really just want to know what it is. Yeah. And and if nobody does know what it is, and it's truly a mystery, which it's starting to seem like, well, if nobody can give us any answers at some point, I'll have to try to figure out how to take the next step, you know? And yeah. Make them up and they'll come through anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, the issue is that, you know, it's too deep to scuba dive. Scuba, mm -hmm. so you got to use, you know, the big ships and sonars. You have to do an expedition. and Yeah. Or, so basically, you would want to put a bathysphere down there or something that's got a hard, uh, hard integrity hull on it. Ab absolutely. So, you know, before I get to that point or even, you know, get serious about anything like that, I wanted to put it out there, get people's suggestions and make sure nobody knows what this feature is, you know.
Yeah. So you have some ideas. You have a list of about six ideas that you think it could be. Um, yep. And I totally enjoyed reading this article and the exercise it put my mind through uh, <laughs> when, while, while I was considering this. So why don't you go through and break down the possibilities and then I'll let you know what I think. <laughs> Perfect. Well, right. I'll, I'll list out the possibilities first and then we can go through each one of them briefly. And yeah, okay. So the first possibility and the most likely or the most suggested has been that of a possible cometary impact. Uh, another possibility is volcanism. Another one is a possible ancient mega mound site that's now submerged. Uh, another one has been suggestion is a, suggested as an Atlantean harbor where they possibly could have mined for copper. This was a huge copper area. And another one is possibly an underwater governmental base or on the other hand, a underwater extraterrestrial base, possibly a USO base. So those are are possible options and the most suggested I've came up with so far from the people I've talked to. So do you want to go through and starting from the top and go down to the bottom and give us some of the evidence for each one? Yeah, that's probably be the best way to go about it. All right, cool. Uh, the first and pro probably the most suggested possibility was that of a cometary impact. And that is possible. Um, now in this area, when they're talking about a cometary impact, it would have been covered with ice sheets. We're talking about 12 to 13,000 years ago. And scientists, some scientists believe that a cometary impact slammed us back into our ice age. Now, up until this point, some other scientists believe that it was the meltwater. The meltwater had gotten into the Atlantic Ocean. The conveyor belt stopped, and that slammed us back into the ice age. But others feel it was most likely a cometary impact that impacted the Laurentide ice sheet, which is would have been exactly over top of this feature at the time. But their main problem in proving this theory is they have no cometary impact crater. So one possibility, this feature is where a cometary impact could have taken place, and it it would describe help to describe the you know coming back into the ice age again and the instant snap. Mm -hmm. uh, the pro one problem with that theory is when you compare this feature with other cometary impacts, normally they are pretty much circular, where this feature has got a little bit of an oblong shape to it with a little indentation, but that has been speculated that that could be from the comet hitting the ice and giant sheets of ice slamming into the, the ground, creating that different shape. So that's one possibility, and it's a, it's a somewhat likely possibility. Now, the next one that has been suggested is that of volcanism or an ancient caldera, or maybe the, the top of the caldera that's still sticking up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, this area was very volcanic, region, one of the most volcanic regions in the world, but we're talking about around a billion years ago. So it's quite a time time gap between now and a billion years. It depends how you view time. Well, it does depend how you view time. <laughs> Absolutely. And it depends if our history has been yep. reported correctly, you know, all the timelines up at the ice. A lot of it depends on, on that. Absolutely. Uh, one of my main downfalls to this theory is that if this was a remnant of a volcano from a billion years ago or so, these ice sheets have retreated back and forth over this area many different times. And if you look at Isle Royale or any of the neighboring landscapes, you'll see the landscape has literally been gouged by these ice sheets. Mm -hmm. So you would think that same gouging effect would have pretty much erased this structure if, that, if it was a billion years old. So unless there's been a eruption that wasn't recorded in history in the last 12 to 13,000 years ago, I feel that's kind not a really likely scenario, but that is one that many people have put out there. Um, the third scenario, uh, ancient mega mound site. Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons to compare it to that is basically the shape of it. And it's uniformness. It's very uniform. The mm -hmm. height of the walls are 250 feet the entire way around. The 
floor of the structure is the exact same level the entire way across it, mm -hmm. which is very unusual for a three and a half mile stretch underwater. Yep. So it, it does, I mean, looking at it and taking measurements, it does seem to have a man-made man -made features to and it. And there are a lot of mounds in that area anyway, in general, right? This, there, this area there used to be a, yep, There used to be a lot of mounds. Most of them that were on land have been destroyed now in Michigan. The right. farmers pretty much tore them down. But mm -hmm. this being underwater at one time, this would have been dry land. So there's always that small possibility that this could be a remnant of an ancient mound. Now, the problem with that theory is the largest ancient mound in the world right now is down in Ohio, the Newark Earthworks, and it's mm -hmm. a great circle, but it's probably maybe a half mile, maybe a mile across, I'm just mm -hmm. guessing, but I mean, this feature, we're talking three and a half miles, so it would dwarf any other mound in the world. So, you know, you take that for what it is. It, Could it be the kind of mound that giants would have built when humans may have been bigger? It's incredible you, incredible you bring that up because a lot of my research, and I don't always bring this up, but a lot of my research has pointed back to giants having something to do with mm -hmm. the copper mining. When you find all through the Ohio Valley and Wisconsin and Michigan, they would find giant bones in some of these mounds mm -hmm. and are mingled with the Native American bones. Mm -hmm. The giants would usually be wearing copper ornaments, copper necklaces, copper bracelets, copper breastplates. Hmm. So there always has been some this little connection between the giants hmm. and the copper. I've never yeah. been able to make the total connection, but there does seem to be a connection. And when you go up there to uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, right there by Isle Royal, on the cliff face, they have some petroglyphs. And hmm. one of the main petroglyphs is a set of giant hands. Mm -hmm. So... I, I would I could go along with that with no problem. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that's that's kind of where we are with the ancient mega mound site. Rather that's number three. That's yeah. number three. Rather unlikely but possible. Yeah. I mean I think all these are possible. Yeah. Uh, the fourth one is a possible Atlantean harbor or maybe a mining operation, and then uh, the Cretaceous Plato mentions that. Poseidon's temple in Atlantis and some of the walls and pillars and large portions of Atlantis were made out of what he called orichalcum, which was a mineral and metal derived mostly from copper. Mm -hmm. And according to legend and mythology, the city would just sparkle in this orangish reddish orichalcum mm -hmm. made, made out of this copper. And these ancient copper mines we have up here, over 5,000 of them at minimum, mm -hmm. I mean, this would be they're five, four, five thousand years old. Is it possible that the Atlanteans could have known of this, these copper deposits? Mm -hmm. And if so, did they come and set up a harbor area, set up a copper mining mm -hmm. thing, and you know, use that to use the? It does look them? not that different than a rock quarry or something like that, right? It, the way it, exactly, it doesn't. Yeah. It looks like a rock quarry, and you, I mean, you got an entrance in and out of it. I yep. mean, so that's an, another possibility, and that one a lot of people find unlikely, but I really don't. If, you know, if the Atlantean story has any seed of truth to it, which I believe it does, mm -hmm. we, we got mines here, you know, dating thousands and thousands of years ago that are somewhat a mystery. It mm -hmm. wouldn't surprise me if that those minerals were used elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You've got to admit that, that that's, that's a hell of a big mine. It's absolutely, it would be, yeah, beyond. But again, going back to the giant hypothesis, maybe not. All right. And back to the giants just briefly, when we look at the ancient mythological stories of the giants, many times they were metal workers and they came down here and taught humanity how to right. work metal. Yeah. So that does correspond in a pretty so nice. kind of digging into the Nephilim type uh, lure here a little bit. Yep, ab absolutely. I mean, it can take a lot of strange turns. And like I said, I don't always bring the giants into it, but in my head, the, it's a it's a possibility. That's yep. a definite possibility because I, I think that with some of the mounds in Ohio too. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, All right, so that's four. That's four. Now, now it's where it starts to get interesting. All right. 
the other suggestion has been an underwater governmental base, yeah. which I may not have taken that seriously if it wasn't for a story I was told by a, a longtime acquaintance, uh, Wayne May. He's the publisher of Ancient American Magazine. Mm -hmm. And years ago, when I first discovered this, I was talking to him about the copper mystery and mentioned, you know, I, I found this unusual structure off the coast and I sent it to him. And he said, he, you know, no clue what it was, but he had a story to relate to me about one of his friends. And it, his friend was out there fishing in this exact area, just off the border of Canada. And he says he's out there fishing and a periscope mm -hmm. comes out of the water and turns and basically looks at him. And he said he, the guy was so scared that he vowed he would never go back out in the area fishing again. He will, at this point, only go on the south shores of Isle Royale. It terrified him. Yeah. So, you know, if it wasn't for that story, I'm, I might not be so serious about this speculation. But, I mean, according to Wayne, this guy would not just come up with this story, you know. So, if, if the government did have you know, certain technology you want to hide. There's no better place to hide that technology than an underwater. And in particular, yep. underwater in Lake Superior, there's just nobody up there. I mean, I mean, you think the oceans are desolate. Lake Superior, there's nobody up there. So if you wanted to hide someplace and it's, I mean, it's on the border of two countries, that's a, another good place to hide it, you know. Mm -hmm. So possible, maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe I wouldn't say no. I'd, I'd give it a possibility. Yeah. Now, the sixth possibility, and my personal favorite due to my quest up there and talking to locals, is a possible underwater USO or extraterrestrial base. And the one thing I've been up there three times over the last six or seven years trying to figure something out and I go up there and I talk to the ship captains and I talk to the scuba divers. And I'd say half of the time when I, I'd approach somebody, before I'd get a chance to show them the picture, I'd ask them if they ever heard of the underwater structure, you know, out by Isle Royal. And many times they would say, oh, do you mean the UFO base? Ah. And, and that was not what I definitely not what I expected to hear. So I don't know if there are people going up there asking questions about UFOs mm -hmm. or it's because they're seeing things, but mm -hmm. I, at least half of the people I asked, and I've had to ask a good, I'm guessing 50 people talk to them yeah. and half of them, the first thing out their mouth is, you know, are you talking about the UFO base out in the lake? <laughs> and of course I say no, but they've, they've got me thinking now. And there's, it's a hot spot for UFO sightings up there. They see lights going in, in and out of the water all the time. I used to actually be a UFO investigator when I first got into this kind of stuff here in Michigan for Michigan MUFON. And that was the hot spot up in this area around Lake Superior. There are just numerous sightings. Uh, one sighting that's rather, rather popular is, is 1953. Uh, there's an Air Force base right in this local area, Kinross Air Force Base. And of course there is. Of course there is, <laughs> exactly. There's one in America on this side, and there's one in Canada just on the uh -huh. other side. So the Kinross Air Force Base gets a report of an unidi unidentified flying object, and they send out an uh, interceptor jet to chase down this object. And they're watching this all take place on radar. They're watching the interceptor jets little blip come, in, come towards the unidentified blip and the two blips merge and then disappear. So instantaneously they send out another jet, you know, looking for this guy and don't find him. So they start sending out the boats and they never found the interceptor plane and they never found the so-called unidentified flying object. So, I mean, in, you know, five and six aren't mutually exclusive of each other either. And it strikes me, exactly looking at the structure, and even in comparison to the Malibu structure, it's almost an inversion of the Malibu structure yes. in terms of depth versus the elevation of the Malibu structure. But 
What's interesting to me is that we have heard stories for years about operations running out of uh, places, uh, Pine Gap in Australia, which are joint operations, not only Mali National, but let's just say that uh, intergalactic in a, in a sense as well. And looking at those two structures and looking at the location of it, it strikes me that there's more going on here in terms of potential for this to be exactly that. You, I'm also wondering, let me address that first. I mean, or, or if we just look at this kind of creatively based on the conspiratorial mind and the location of an Air Force base, which I would have expected that. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this is a pretty strategic place, as you pointed out not only because of it sitting on the border of U.S. and Canada, but even this location so close to the center of the country mm -hmm. as a strategic site for something. Yeah, 100%. And speaking of a strategic site, this anomaly was not always part of the United States. It was Benjamin Franklin, actually, actually who did a treaty. And, he oh, and, Benjamin, and Benjamin Franklin, of course, was a mound gritter. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he did a land treaty, and he had the lines of the U.S.-Canadian border redrawn. That's why. So now they would encapsulate Isle Royal. That's why. But also encapsulated this anomaly by literally a half mile. Isle Royal was the, 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 the sham for, why, for, for this. Because he was a mound gritter. Yeah. He loved that yeah. stuff. Like, he yeah. was super into that. I, I, yeah. I listened to Raz Ben a fair amount. So, yeah. right. But, uh, okay, so I'm thinking a couple of other things on, in, when we're dealing with these last two anomalies, and, and then we can kind of get into my grand theory of everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But, so I think two things. A couple years ago when people started hearing all these weird sounds coming from the sky, I feel like it was in that area as well. They felt like there were some were coming from the sky and some were maybe coming from underground and they couldn't figure out what. But there was people out there. I remember watching videos of people out there on their boats and people, camera yep. crews listening. And, and yeah, there was definitely some weird noises happening. Yep. So I wanted to know if you've talk, you know, thought about that being related to this somehow. Uh, I never really connected the two, but there's no, I don't see no reason why not to. Okay, so that. And then um, have you ever spoken to Dave Politis? I haven't spoken to him, but I'm familiar with his work. So I, I haven't listened to his stuff in a long time, but I have a fairly good memory. And I seem to recall there was at least one anomaly of his that was in that very same area. Yeah, there and was. If you, look at yeah. His, if you look at his work, if you go to his website, you can see the number of missing people that he has that are over what are mapped out bases underneath the ground in the United States almost match on a 100% level. Wow. Well, no, I, I haven't seen that uh, <clears throat> part of his research, but that's very interesting. Yeah. Very so, interesting. And that, that might be interesting for you to have a chat with him as well, because he's yeah. always looking at that kind of stuff. And he has, I'm sure, theories that he has not shared. He's, he likes to just kind of report the data, right, which is why we haven't had him on the show. We're big fans of his work. But he, well, he's kind of disappeared. He's been very low profile mm -hmm. for uh, yeah, pretty about low 18 pro months. But, if he, if we were to have him on the show, we would want to push him for his theories, and I don't know that he wants right. to be pushed. But I, his his work is so interesting. Like I've oh, been absolutely. down several several rabbit holes of his. Yeah, um, absolutely, so, Mr. So Regent, what, go ahead, Ray. No, because his thoughts crossed my mind twice now. I'll entertain it. This region is also a hot spot for what we call Yeti Bigfoot. Yep. Yes. Um, and that's what Dave Politis's work is largely framed around that. That's where he started. Yeah. Yeah. So I just thought I would pull that into the pile of things that we're looking at because they also seem to be, and this area of Lake Michigan has a whole bunch of paranormal Lake stuff. Superior, that is, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry, Lake, Lake Superior. Yeah. It, there's a whole lot of strange things that have gone on there in terms of disappearances. Mm -hmm. Um, different types of specular entities that have been seen. Yep. Uh, so this is an anomalous region. And I can't help but think that the copper has something to do with that, which is why mm -hmm. we, we wind up back at the giants again. Because if you go and you look at the lure of the Nephilim, 
um, metallurgy was one of the big arts there. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Atlantis, Atlantis's alleged demise was obviously the misuse of a certain type of energy. But I look at the earth from the standpoint that we live in a different environment now than we did, well, <laughs> we did 50 years ago, but that's a separate issue. But that far back in time, there are no we may have been anymore. dealing with a very electrically charged atmosphere as a result of the vortex forces and, and things like that. So I'm thinking this is so, so strategic in terms of not just its location, but what's in it and how that may relate to even being some sort of epicenter. I, I think you nailed it, Randy. And I consider this area a window area or uh -huh. a gateway yeah. area where yep. maybe the veil, so to speak, is thinner mm. and have all this phenomena taking yep. place. Like you said we got UFOs, we got Bigfoots, we have what's called the Paulding Lights up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have... Mishu Pishu is the local water mon monster underwater. We have the mm. Thunderbirds, all in this literal, literally localized yeah. small area. And then in that area, we have maybe a governmental base or an extraterrestrial base, or like you said, a combination of the two. So it, like you said, it would make sense if this was some kind of base, why it would be strategically placed right here in the middle of what I consider a window or a gateway area to all this phenomena yeah so okay so i'm um, this is the first time i'm going to try and vocalize it but i'm sitting the other day at lunch reading your article and i'm like okay so i don't randy said the last two are not mutually exclusive i don't think any of them are mutually ex mutually exclusive no actually i agree with if you this yeah. is a window if this is like what i'm thinking is if we live in a multi-dimensional reality or a, re a, a, a multiple you know whatever t kind of thing there's got to be some places where they all sort of come together. And those would be the places where there's a soft spot, where things can come through, right? And if it's a window, if there's something there that especially can be seen from the sky or seen from outside of the simulation, if you subscribe to simulation theory, as I partially do, mm -hmm. then like this is an entry point. There's also, you know, this idea, this, you know, so esoteric idea that you always have to sort of enter reality or enter the world through water, right? So all of these things, so let's just for, like, for also a second pretend that like time doesn't really exist. All of these things could be happening simultaneously and not everybody knows that this space is here like that. That's part of the reason for the tremendous amount of secrecy and why nothing goes on on Lake Superior. But the people who know, know, right? And so you have the aliens are interested in it, the government is interested in it. You know, maybe like when, if a comet hit there, if a, you know, maybe it was going for the target that was there. Mm -hmm. There was something there that it was aiming for. It hit that, you have an ice age, which is usually followed by the opposite, which would then be a volcano, right? And then the people would know that this was an important- So maybe it's a blast site, site too. Right, the, the, yeah. the, the indigenous people would know this is an important site. They'd build a mound there, right? And so all of your theories start to become, you know, I, I think it's all of them. I think this is, I mean, is this possibly where you enter the reality of planet Earth? I'm thinking mm. of the Duran Duran well, song, This Is Planet this. Earth, right? Yeah. I, I like that, that grand theory, Emily. That, yeah. Have like you seen that, that Duran Duran video? That Duran Duran no. video has an ice wall behind it, right? And it's so. up, down, all around, looking for signs of life. I mean, if something crashed here in the ice right. age, right. right? And they're like, what's going on? I'm starting to find that Duran Duran tells you everything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right? well, yeah. I've said it a couple times. It's the finest Tavistock has to offer. <laughs> well, you said something that I hadn't thought about previously, but just made a whole lot of sense about the comet impact and then the ancients turning that into a mound site. Right. The Serpent Mound in Peebles, Ohio, that's exactly what happened. It's mm -hmm. an ancient meteoric impact site, and mm -hmm. they built the Serpent Mound on top of it. Right. So that would totally make sense. I mean, something. and to people on the ground, a comet might look like a serpent coming from the sky. Of course, right? yeah. Right. Yeah. There's also the other thing that made me think of this is there is that um, I don't know. I don't know how into, and we're going to get into the dance music in the second hour and the techno and the Detroit and whatever. But I was at a party several years ago, maybe five years ago now, six years ago, and the live PA. The name of the live PA was Black Asteroid. Okay, and I was listening to the music, and I had 
the th thought occurred to me that maybe that is what is inside of asteroids, right? Sound. And, it, and that maybe that was the impetus for his naming himself. It was kind of some really wild, otherworldly, but not like in an ethereal way, like in a really hard, like rocks pounding together, metal, technological kind of way, sounding music. And I was like, I wonder if that, that like an asteroid is almost like a time capsule from another place and there's a, this sound of that space is coming in and hits here and just sounds like some kind of, you know, sound you know, and, and that hits, it blasts. A comet could be something similar, or maybe it was an asteroid, or you know, or whatever. And then you think about the fact that Michigan is really the birthplace of almost all of the kinds of music we currently appreciate. Yeah. Right. So it would make sense that the sound came from somewhere else and found its home right there where it landed. I like that, Emily. And you also mentioned the strange booms they've been hearing up there. What if those booms? Mm. That's t right. It's the same. I mean, what right? if those booms are ancient echoes. booms? Yeah, echoes. Echoes. echoes like, time. Yeah, like, and that's the sound that, like, for me, techno music is the boom, 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 right? Like, <laughs> yeah. back in the day, yeah. like, back in the day, we had, like, some party called the, the Temple of Boom, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's what I'm thinking of, right? Yes. You know, so it was like, it was Ark Entertainment and Temple of Boom and whatever, but th this is what I'm thinking of, and just sort of, like, people really don't understand that this entire, and we can get into some of this in the next hour. I want to continue with the anomaly for now, but really like what has happened in that area is exactly what could only happen when you have something, an anomaly like that occur, right? That it becomes, you know, exactly what it was destined to be. Yeah, I can go along with that 100%. <laughs> 100%. All right. So I got that one out there. So Randy, what do you think of my grand theory of everything? <laughs> the toe. The big toe. Nice Emily's toe, big yeah. toe. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, well, think you... I, I was sitting here thinking comet, asteroid, anything that big. Now think also about what comes in on one of those large objects. A mm -hmm. lot of rare metals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Absolutely. what if you know what speakers are made out of? Ferric oxide. Yeah. And yeah. Copper yeah. windings. Yeah. Um, this has potential to just be like giants doing four on the floor kicking it, man. <laughs> right? Like, what if this is a big giant rave, right? <laughs> well, I, I do think the more I like. The Nephilim you know, boogie. Right? The more I get into, you know, like one of the things we love to just dig into here, and it's probably like my most important sort of t topic to me emotionally is this issue of time. And mm. I do think that copper, people like to talk about gold and silver and, you know, or mis I think yep. copper is the metal of, of, you know, time travel or of dissolving time or existing outside of time. And maybe that is sort of why the giants would wear these things, right? Like when they're here and they're wearing, you know, they need, they exist, maybe they exist outside of time. And in order to not be subject to time, you have to have a certain amount of copper on you, which would also explain why the elites, blue bloods, they have more copper in their blood, blood. right? They fucking live forever, even, you know, they mm. look like, you know, disgusting, you know, d demonic ghouls, but like some of these fools live forever, dude, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the, um, I, I think about that, you know, and, and also like, for as far as Atlantis, right? They know that like whatever, you know, I think of Atlantis as existing also outside of time and, or to not being subject to time. And so maybe copper is really, really important to like, it, it, I mean, I'm going to have to go dig into if that's one of the minerals that have been mostly stripped from all of our soil and stuff like that. Is that what is making us so subject to linear time? Mm. Yeah. 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 And, they, and they, why the elites can pull off all this bullshit outside know, you of time. You come on our show, and you've got perfectly good material, but we pull you into our jackpot. Hey, <laughs> that's what I like, man. That's what I like. Now, you, you guys both separately said something that makes a lot of sense. Randy, you we said... We usually do. You, I, I, I watch and you usually do. <laughs> Randy, you mentioned you thought there's a possibility it could have something to do with the copper. And Emily, you mentioned some, possibly something to do with the water. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with both of those very heavily. Say the water, when I'm looking at different ancient landscapes around the Midwest, the, the country, but the Midwest in particular, they're always near the water, 
always. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the, wa the water has a certain frequency or vibration, but these landscapes mm -hmm. are always near the water. Have you considered that there could still possibly be a civilization of underwater breathers down there? I have, I have considered that. And what makes me consider that are the Native American legends up there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Thunderbird up there was the guardian of the upper worlds and Mishu mm -hmm. which is a underwater water panther, mm -hmm. is the guardians of the waters and the underworld. Mm -hmm. And they talk about these mythological creatures as if they were real at one point. Mm -hmm. Literally right across from Isle Royale in Canada, on the Canada side, the one mountain is supposed to be the realm of the Thunderbird, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. mountain next to it is the land of, his name was Manabojo, and he mm -hmm. was their cultural hero, hero and believed to be a giant. So literally mm -hmm. the two mountains across from Isle Royal in this feature were supposed to be the home, one of them of the Thunderbirds, and the other one is called the Sleeping Giant, home of the giant. Nice. So. I wonder if there's any relationship between copper and the ability to breathe or stay underwater for a long time as well, Randy. What do you think about that? Mm. I'd have to I'd have to meditate on that a little bit more. So, I, I, Chad, I don't know if you've heard us discuss several times this whole idea of breathing underwater, and you know, with almost not everyone, but a large portion of people we've talked to who've been through black projects and mind control experiences and stuff like that. Yep. The, the number of times that memories of uh, be, breathe, being trained to breathe underwater, how, how much that has come up, including for, for myself and people that I'm, that I'm close to and whatever, it's uncanny. Well, there are, in this same area, I'm talking about a window area. I forgot yep. to mention this when we were talking about Bigfoot and everything. Mer, Merman, Mm. Mermaids are mm -hmm. another highly, mostly in the, the myth and lore out there, but the mermen and the, the mermaids are supposed to surround this island and be guardians of the copper, is the legend. Interesting. And same with Mishu Pishu, the underwater panther. He was supposed to be a guardian of the copper. He actually was supposed to have a copper tail. And mm -hmm. the Native Americans... Supposedly, supposedly wouldn't even look in the direction of the island. When they were out there canoeing, they were mm -hmm. so terrified of Mishu Pishu and him being a guardian that they were not supposed to even look in that direction. Is there any connection between Mishu Pishu and Machu Picchu? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, that's interesting. It's just such I, I never thought of that's very similar. Right? It, it, right, and I, I just I'm starting to think. Okay, maybe is there a ley line connection? Is there a you know uh, what I mean? Like, what is the is there is there a, a creature that also inhabits Machu Picchu that would be similar to this? That of course being above ground, but this is inverted underground. So something being sticking up above the. I, it's just super interesting. I don't know. There is a small connection to Machu Picchu through Michigan, and there's a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Peter Shampoo, and <laughs> and he he did what's called the. Uh, uh, well, he, he made a pentagram layout that fits perfectly over the state of Michigan and it touches each corner of Michigan and when you extend the lines of the pentagram, they touch sacred locations across the world. Mm. One of them hits the, the pyramids, one of them hits okay. Stone okay. right? one of them hits Machu Picchu. So here we go. So that's it. So. Right. And, and, well, and the it, Michigan biome, that's what he calls it. The Michigan, the Michigan biome. Bi and, and the pentagram being the perfect portal the perfect sort of the, sigil as a portal the yeah say the pentagram is all over in michigan mm -hmm. start, you can start with the michigan biome where it's the whole state mm -hmm. and then you can go down in particular into detroit where it's a street layout and then you can mm -hmm. scale it down even the more I, I, I gonna, exactly randy you go down the street layout in the middle of that pentagram yeah. is a pentagon building mm -hmm. and then at the chrysler symbol you got car yeah. driving around this pentagonal building with pentagon Grammal, you know, hood ornaments on them. Yeah. I mean, it's just like almost sigil magic then. It yeah. is. In absolutely. Some sense. So on a really large scale, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that would be, could be said for uh, uh, like most of these kinds of cities sure. that you're talking about and we'll yeah. talk about in the next hour. Like, I don't agree with everything he says, but I ha have appreciated at times some of the work of Andrew Bartsis and he talks about sacred geometry cities mm -hmm. and that these were intentionally built in sort of sacred geometry shapes to pr facilitate the flow into and out of them. And I think he's t he was mostly talking about roads in and out, but why also not this way too? Yes. Right? See, yeah. Say I'm more with the theory, the up and down the yes. between worlds. Say to me, the pentagram in its most general sense 
It can represent the human body, of mm -hmm. course. It can represent the earthly five elements. Yep. So you got the human body connected to the earth and, mm -hmm. of course, the stars. So it's one symbol that can connect the earth, the body, and the stars all together. Which, which, which actually takes us to what Randy thought we might come up with earlier with is some inner earth stuff. So one thing we like to talk about a lot is this obsession people have with focusing out, right, as opposed to focusing in and the relationship between outer space and inner space, the thing that connects right. that, the junction is our body. So Absolutely. you just nailed it there with that, right there, yeah. So we kind of deal with, even the name of the show is kind of almost an anomaly in itself because we don't really <laughs> believe in, in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> there's something that's probably off planet and what do they say in space there's no up or down well inside the earth there's not only no up and down time starts to get really strange there right right and so i've been captivated by the idea that i've had this concept for like ever that what's and I was, as a kid i can remember digging in my parents backyard with all the shale rock and looking at it and just thinking <laughs> this 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 strata what if we're dealing with an earth construct it's not hollow earth it's stratified levels and layers mm -hmm. and then on top of that i had somebody who was inside of covert projects in a completely off-handed conversation that was not a show, tell me he was very much aware of the fact that there was an entire under the continent confluence that allowed submarines to pass literally right underneath mm -hmm. the continental United States with an egress point somewhere around Rhode Island, Newport News, Long Island. Okay. That that was pretty specific, but the Malibu base is where that gets interesting because that is actually the area close to where there would be the entrance to go into this. And this is a very quick okay. passage by submarine under the continental shelf or what we think is the continental shelf. Right, right. So well, you've got, you know, I've... what's underneath all of this is layers and levels where there's water where there's air, where there's worlds within worlds. It's a, it's a Russian nesting doll kind All right, of. And I'll, and I'll tie another piece so. here. So we're talking about Michigan. We're talking about Los Angeles. This is two places with the massive party scenes that are called undergrounds, yeah. right? Yeah. And I have noticed that the, when I started to notice time anomalies was with music at these parties. In fact, there is a party here that is called Sublevel. <laughs> right, like it's a recurring party. That's Doc Martin's recurring party. That's been going on for twenty, you know, forever and ever. And I'm tell you this: at that party, sometimes, like I've been to it several times. Like you know, so I, I, sometimes they have music I care for, sometimes they don't. The world feels not like sometimes I feel like I'm in like a Wurlitzer or like a Tilt a Whirl or whatever. There's something funny going on there. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's something funny about lots of the parties that I go to. Each one has their own kind of thing. Yeah. But you know, these are both really an urban sort of super urban kinds of cities right on bodies of water that yep. have this attachment to this kind of music that is related to the technology that is based on time that is well that's exactly uh, what you're talking about the subwoofers these gigantic mm -hmm. speaker systems which by the way when you put them on a solid surface near water you mm -hmm. have wave projection machines the subsonic yeah. frequencies that you actually see and feel reverberate far lower down in the Hertz scale in terms of earth penetrating frequencies and signals. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that's an important point you made about the, the wave vibrations because yeah. th those are going through us. We're, mm -hmm. we're getting those. We're water. Same, we're water. water. We're yeah. getting those same vibrations you, you would see the woofers putting out on a sheet of water. Yeah, well that, I mean, so I, you know, I've spoken about uh, the inner eye visions that I have while I'm dancing is it's like internal cymatics, right? It's like, so I'm closing my eyes, I'm hearing the sound and I'm getting the geometric patterns that are very similar to like the salt on the plate or the cymatic underwater kind of stuff and whatever. So yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Wow. So, all right. So have you like, 
have you spoken to any other people? Like, I mean, I know you talk to the people around there, but you have like a lot of quotes on your site from William Henry and people like that. Have you spoken to any of these people about this and what do they think? Uh, about the anomaly? Yeah. Uh, I showed it to William years and years ago. He was, he was blown away by it, but really didn't know where to point me in what direction. You know, he didn't know what it was or had no clue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really been what I get from everybody I've shown it to. And I, I've been careful showing it to people. I don't show them. I was always careful not to show them the exact location. So I'd show them just the feature, mm -hmm. you know, because I've been working on it a long time. I didn't want somebody just to go and make the discovery. Is, is there so, a lot of, or any, uh, of the cloaked cloud craft activity above this lake? Are, are you familiar with Sean Gattro's work? I'm not familiar with him, but there are, I don't know if you'd call them the cloaked clouds, but they see, like they see, call them the cities in the clouds. Where oh, like, okay, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah, right, right. Yep, and that's, that's cool. a... That's a phenomenon they seem to have up there. Is they see these cities in the clouds, but mm -hmm. they'll they'll say it's the reflection of a city from 50 miles away off the atmosphere, mm -hmm. or this or that. It's but, an inversion. Yeah, right. exactly. So, so I I recommend you check out Sean Gatro's work. He's been a guest okay. several times on our show. His YouTube channel is Industrial Surrealism, which also okay. goes along with sort of what we're going to be talking about in the next exactly. hour. And <laughs> He started no noticing these uh, anomalous things over the body of water near his house. And, it, 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 right? And uh, yep. I think you'll find it. I mean, I actually, they could actually, I mean, Randy, it could actually explain Sean's craft. <laughs> what yes, he's talking I, about. Yeah, so obviously the water has something to do with it. I mean, the Great Lakes, see, and we're talking about Lake Superior, but Lake Michigan has what's called the Lake Michigan Triangle. Mm -hmm. where Many ships, many planes have disappeared. Right. Lake Erie, they're, they're rumored. Erie. Yep. <laughs> and they're rumored to have the same thing. They're rumored to have an underwater base. There's UFOs and, going in and out of the water yeah. all the time. Lake Erie is a really cool Aren't place. the Great Lakes yep. where people like to try and prove that the earth is flat from? Like they'll try and like ride their, they'll try and look at Chicago from Detroit or sure. ride their boat across yeah. and show. I, I have heard that. Yep. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, because, it, you know, in terms of observation, it breaks the two miles per, two inches yeah. per every 35 mile declination of the, yep. Yep. so obviously those are the, those are the things that they go towards. Well, also, but also if it's a window, it would be flat. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> what, if what if it's concave? Concave. <laughs> right? talk, well, that, it's well, that's actually concave. that's actually my preference. Like, if we're gonna get into those kinds of, mm -hmm. of theories, the concave Earth is is, I, is the one that I find more interesting than the flat Earth. Are you familiar with the concave Earth? No, I'm not. Theory. I mean, no. it, I, I've talked about it a couple of times on the show. It's not. I'm not saying that this is what I believe, but I find it more fascinating. So. It, there's this guy named Cyrus Reed Teed who wrote a book called The Cellular Cosmogony. Okay. And he believed yep. that belief in the earth's concavity is equal to godliness, right? Okay. And that we're actually living on the inside of the earth as opposed to on the outside of the earth. And that, so there's this really kooky guy named Lord Stephen Christ who talks about this. And he's almost entirely batshit except for the few things that he said <laughs> that make a lot of sense and that are quite interesting. And I was able to Sort of like I found you down a rabbit hole. I went down this rabbit hole one night and discovered connections to possible connections to um, the Waco, th the Waco thing, to free energy technology, to all of this interesting kind of stuff. And it, it was based, so like this belief in the Earth's concavity was called Koreshanity, right? Okay. And David Koresh, right? His name is David Koresh, right. and this, these people that believed in the Earth's concavity lived in like on a compound kind of like he does and they would be badgered by the local you know law and stuff like that and they had some weird beliefs but what they were doing basically was growing their own food and they were experimenting with some free energy kinds of things and they actually did some nice things to help their community mm -hmm. and the marshal came in and killed this person right beat him to death and this was like back in the 1800s i believe this was in florida but it, it, it almost sounds exactly like what happened at, at waco Right. right. Yeah. And, wow. You know, and this guy's name was David Koresh. And wow. the same week I discovered this thing with the Koreshanity and the concave earth and whatever, for just like three or four days, Eric Holder was calling ISIS Khorasan. 
And Khorasan <laughs> was spelled the same way that they spell Khorasan, Khorasanity, right? Wow. And I was like, dude, what is this, right? This is some kind of weird, it was literally the same week that these it's videos like and I went down the rabbit hole. So yeah. there, was a, there was a debrief on the concaver. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that. That's very interesting, quite synchronistic. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's how this stuff goes though. Exactly, and if the earth was concave, exactly. If right. Earth was concave and Lake Superior was the window to it, that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, hmm. it would. You got my mind going, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a few minutes left here in the first hour, and you did bring up, I just want to hit on this briefly because I think this is a topic that we will go into with other guests in the future, but a lot of your work is about mounds, mm -hmm. and you brought up the possibility that this was you know, a remnant of, of a mound. Um, can you just give us a little bit of your, just tell people about a little bit about your work on the mounds, what the mounds really are, and how they really kind of relate to this, all this stuff we all talk about. People sometimes think of these, this as a different thing, as it just being like an indigenous kind of whatever, but it's really related to all the other conspiracy shit we talk about. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I've been researching the mounds for a while. Uh, there's several different kinds of Native American mounds. There's the burial mounds, which are what they say they are. And there's also the temple mounds, which they usually would have ceremonies or whatnot. They were the sacred space. And then there's also geometric earthworks, which mm -hmm. are many times large circles, octagons, pentagons. And all of these mounds and mound sites are almost always correlated, usually to the stars. Mm -hmm. And they, I believe that by correlating them to the stars, that they felt they could draw down those energies and basically utilize those energies. And you go when you go to the, a lot of these sites, like my favorite personally is the Serpent Mount. Mm -hmm. But you go there and you can, I mean, you can feel the energy that's still pulsating through these grounds. And most likely that's why like they built their sites there. And for the Serpent Mount, it's built on top of an ancient meteoric impact. They're mm -hmm. scientifically proven gravitational anomalies, uh, magnetic anomalies. And I think the ancients recognized these anomalies and worked on utilizing them. Say the serpent mount in particular, uh, where the serpent's mouth opens up and it appears to be swallowing a cosmic egg. At mm -hmm. one time, there used to be a giant stone monolith right in the center of this egg. And it was thrown over the cliff at some point. You can still find this monolith at the bottom of the cliff below the serpent mound. Yeah. But they believe this giant monolith was actually used as a lightning attractor. And they would... Huh. So that I, goes to the concept of free energy as well, because you would need that kind of interesting... Absolutely. And they, they would try to utilize these energies. Now, back in the 1800s, this is after the monolith had been thrown off probably hundreds of years ago. But farmers in the area thought they could wreck, I mean, these are farmers. These ain't people like us nowadays that, you know, talking about energy and stuff. These are farmers were going there saying they felt something funny, basically, and in particular by the head of the serpent. So mm -hmm. what, what they did is they took a bunch of different variety of seeds. I was going to ask. Yeah. As an experiment, they planted these seeds in the mouth of the serpent. And the seeds that they planted, supposedly, not only did they all germinate, 100% of the seeds germinated, which is unusual, but the crops themselves, they said, would yield 50 to 100% mm. better than their average crops. So this sounds like what some people report with crop circles. Well, Patty Greer talked about that. Yeah. Patty, Patty Greer's talked about Very you know, the connections between the energy of the crop circles and what basically would be this, this particular wave type, and I don't remember the name of it right now, that could be used to develop pretty much limitless food supplies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it sounds it's like... Energy is the, the key to... It isn't just the energy, but the frequency of the energy itself that goes into this and the amplitude behind it. There's All right, I'm getting another food. idea here, too. All right, go for it, Emily. <laughs> That's it. All right, so what if... Okay, what if the mounds are built on ancient crop circles? What if we've been mm -hmm. having crop circles 
since the beginning of time and there are these geometric forms or these shapes and whatever, and it creates an energy field inside of them. And then the people who live there, what is that? Okay, maybe they're even just thinking, let's cover it up or let's whatever, right? <laughs> and they're doing it in the shape of this thing that is like a sigil that then draws the energy. I mean, right? Totally makes sense. And <laughs> yep. especially it does. It does. It's the fact that we're talking about the serpent mound, you can Google this, but one of the few crop circles you can find in America, really good documented ones, was right below the serpent mound in the nearest field. <laughs> Right, be, I mean, this is a while back, but it was right below the Serpa Mound, one of the biggest and best documented ones in North America, and there's not a whole lot of them documented I mean, here. We hardly understand crop circles, so ancient people would either know way more about it than us because it was closer to what they come from, or they would be like, what on earth is this? Yeah. And, you know, like, if, if you're not, when you don't have know-how about something, some of your impulse is to cover it up. Right, like, yeah. or even just when you like, I don't know what to do about this. Like when a kid spills the milk, they put <laughs> the paper towel over it, right? Like I don't know what, to, like kind of like that. Like what on earth is this? This feels weird here. I'm gonna, you know, yeah. like this might be trouble. Let's cover it up. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then, you know, or whatever, or they, or they find that like, okay, our stuff grows better here. Or like we heal better if we stay here. We don't want anyone to know about this because this is our secret. Let's cover it up. Well, I think Royal Raymond Reif learned that lesson in the 1930s. <laughs> you, do not want to, you do not want to try and put this out. Wow, there we did. We pulled many threads through some amazing material. Uh, that's ka -ching. It's going to back out this hour. We're going to dump the rest of it over on the other side for the Patreons. All right. And uh, you can find... Uh, Chad, tell people one more time your website, which is... Uh, website is chadstumpke.com. See, and it'll be see. right down there underneath yep. you. Right down there in the link. Perfect. In the little box. Yep. And, and uh, uh, yep. Join us on the other side at patreon.com forward slash off planet media. We are going to talk about Detroit as a Stargate city when we come back. Thank you guys so much for the first hour. Absolutely. All right. We'll be right back, guys. This is Off Planet Radio. Don't 